um, this symposium consists of uh, two lectures both are from united kingdom and uh, each lecture will take about uh, approximately 20 minutes and there will be question time after that um on behalf of SLCC uh, let me uh, welcome both the speakers dr john pesey from uh, southampton hospital and dr manoj das from uh, newcastle upon tyne and uh, i'll hand over to my colleague uh, suresh to introduce dr john pesey Dr John Pacey is a consultant cardiac electrophysiologist at University Hospital Southampton who has done yeoman service in uh, training the next generation of cardiologists in the Wessex deanery. We welcome uh, Dr John Pacey. I'm very honored and grateful to have been asked to deliver this talk on implantable cardiac devices by the Sri Lankan Heart Association particularly as i count several members and officers of the association amongst my former colleagues and friends so it really does give me um double pleasure to be able to present to you and thank you for the opportunity so i decided to talk around a theme of the future of cardiac implantable devices potentially being around the development of leadless technology associated with them and perhaps it's useful just to start by going back over how we ended up where we are today with the paradigm for implantable devices being around the delivery of a lead through the transvenous route so cardiac pacemakers were really developed between 1958 and 1963 It's always sober when you look back and you say, well, when, when was the first? When did the first pacemaker go in, or when did the first ICD go in? And of course, there's never really um, a single moment because these things develop over a period of time. There have been multiple attempts at um, pursuing the concept of pacing before 1958, including direct needle puncture in animal and emergency human procedures, even. But in 1958. there were a series of attempts at delivering pacing from uh, anything from a temporary to a sort of semi-permanent approach approach using both transcutaneous and thoracotomy based um technologies and just a year after these various attempts had been made the first temporary pacemaker was implanted in a a uh, life saving procedure in 1959 and from that point it was really obvious that the correct way to deliver uh um pacing therapy to the myocardium was via the transvenous route so that caused a real ramp up in uh the efforts to develop new technologies which of course is always a blend between the clinical indications and the engineering challenges and by 1963 the first semi permanent transvenous devices had been developed and it was really a question of just refinements moving on from there once that's been achieved now icds were actually first conceptualized not that long after pacemakers right back in 1969 but it was a very long process to get from the point of conception to a working prototype even for animal use and then into humans and there was a considerable amount of um skepticism around whether this was the right route to go down at all um so by 1980 uh Morton Mower um and Michael Moraski had developed the first uh, device which they were able to implant in animals and they managed to get a license to implant for experimental purposes in humans in 1984 and were able to demonstrate a proof of concept which again led to a very rapid development of the engineering investment facilitating the first single chamber shock only transvenous devices from 1987 CRT was the latest of these technologies to come to fruition it wasn't really conceptualized at all until 1994 when in a slightly odd procedure a patient who was in extremis on high care in uh, Ren in France underwent a four chamber thoracotomy based pacing procedure in order to uh, try and improve his cardiac output and this was extremely successful 
again there was a period where the engineering challenges were then overcome it was clear to everybody that this needed to be delivered as a transvenous device and been and by 1998 it was possible to implant transvenous left ventricular leads so the first crtps as we would recognize them um, as transvenous devices were being implanted from 1998 so if we look through the timeline of the development of the functionality of pacing we've got um, single chamber transvenous pacemakers in 1963, dual chamber pacemakers from 1981, um, a transvenous ICD from 1987, but one which needed to be paired with a pacemaker, but one which was capable of bradycardia pacing, so to function as both a brady and tachy device from 1989, the development of anti-tachycardia pacing, the so-called third generation ICDs from 1991, Cardiac resynchronization pacemakers, 97, but really 1998 before they were they were fully rolled out, and then the cardiac resynchronization defibrillator, so bringing all three functions together for the first time, occurring just about 20 years ago. So what's the problem? We've got a fully functioning device. Well, there's a whole series of problems, as those of us uh, who practice in cardiology know only too well. Um, Starting from the implant, there are significant issues associated with hematoma formation at the point of the implant. Uh, pneumothorax is another significant risk associated with implanted lead devices. Once the device has been implanted, there are a number of late complications which we're only too aware of, including lead fracture. Devices after implant become, can become infected or erode and of course once the device is eroded it's to all intents and purposes infected even if it wasn't infection that caused the erosion and the distal end of the pacemaker or implanted device can also become infected with the dreaded pacemaker endocarditis and of course we run into problems with venous occlusion now that can just be subclavian vein occlusion causing usually not too much in the way of symptomatic problems but just difficulties for us when we come to upgrade or replace leads all the way through to a full SVC syndrome associated with indwelling leads. And then of course if an extraction is required the procedural mortality is at least one but can be up to 10%, can of course be higher than that but, but realistically up to 10%. A 30-day mortality, which is much higher than that, anything up to 50%. Emergency, emergency thoracotomy can be required in up to 10% of patients. It's possible to evulse the tricuspid valve, sometimes with catastrophic consequences. Um, an inpatient stay after an extraction for a distal infection can be anything up to six weeks. And a re-implant is almost always more complicated than the original implant after a device has been infected, uh, extracted for infection. So those are the problems, but is, is it really that big a problem? We, we, we can see that it's when it happens, it's a big problem, but how frequent is it? Well, um, on the left there, as you're looking at the slide, is the risk of infection in various types of devices. And you can see even, obviously, we all know that the more complex a device you put in, the higher risk of it becoming infected. But particularly, uh, um, the CRTDs are of very high infection risk with up to 20% infected by 20 years. But even for the simplest pacemakers, the infection rate after you followed the device up for 20 years is up to 5%. And of course, for ICD leads, they're significantly more vulnerable than bradycardia leads. So they have a failure rate associated not just with infection, but also with lead fracture at a much higher rate than pacing leads. And by the time you get out to, uh, to more than f uh, 10 years, by the time you get out to 10 years, 25% of ICD leads have failed. CRT brings its own challenges. So with LV endocardial leads, of course, compared to RV and RA leads, these are more challenging to implant. In a contemporaneous population, the failure rate of implant due to um, difficulties navigating the coronary venous system is around 2.5%. Now, um, 
about 30% of um, appropriately indicated CRT devices are non-responders. And in that 30%, about 20% are due to uh, are due to the lead being placed in uh, not being able to access a completely optimal position despite being able to be implanted originally. So that gives you uh, somewhere around eight or nine percent at a conservative estimate of inability to deliver CRT due to problems associated with navigating the coronary venous system. So what alternatives do we have? Well, I'm sure we all know about leadless right ventricular pacing. There's also an increasing attention to subcutaneous ICDs and the perhaps least developed of these three technologies is ultrasound left ventricular endocardial pacing to facilitate, uh, to facilitate resynchronization therapy. So leadless RV pacing. So at the moment, there's only one show in town and that's the Medtronic device, so the Micra and the Micra AV. Um, I say leadless RV because as things stand at the moment, there's, they, they have not created a marketed atrial pacing option, although that will come relatively soon. So this is delivered via 23 French femoral sheath. Um, in the case of the Micra, it can pace in VVI and VVIR modes. In the case of the Micro AV, it paces in VDI mode, and the way it does that is not via electrical sensing, but via an accelerometer. So the accelerometer detects the atrial contraction and it syncs from there. Between these two models of device, there have been over 50,000 worldwide implants now since 2013. The battery life is between 8 and 13 years projected. Um, they're MRI compatible. They can be followed up remotely. Um, Medtronic in their publicity claim they reduce complications by 60% compared to transvenous devices, but it's hard to stand that up when there's no randomized control trial. But what we have got is pretty robust registry data to say that there's a 99% implant success rate, only 2.7% risk, risk of implant complications, and a really very low, probably 10% or less than transvenous device risk of infections. So there are, of course, other or have been other offerings. So Abbott, nay SGM, uh, made the Nanostim device, which is still out there and threatening to come back at some point. That has a rotational fixing rather than the timed fixing on the uh, Medtronic device. And it was withdrawn following a high tamponade and death rate. And that was probably due to a mixture of its narrower profile so therefore higher pounds per square inch at the interface with the myocardium compared with combined with the rotatory fixing but also um, some different protocols in terms of Medtronic have been very careful about their protocols of training people so for example it's now recognized that you don't implant at the apex you implant onto the apical part of the septum and that if you get that right that pretty much eliminates perforation risk. Boston Scientific have been very close to releasing their Empower device for seemingly years now. Um, it's not yet available, but I'm assured will be very shortly. And it does have one-way communication with the SICD. One way in that the SICD can send it a message to deliver ATP. So that brings us neatly on to subcutaneous ICDs. So sub-Q ICDs are implanted in the parasternal and axillary region. So the lead is tunneled parasternally and the box is placed in the axillary region. And it's these days we place it over the top of serratus, but underneath latissimus. So we open up uh, the anterior lip of the serratus muscle, peel it away and then push the device in behind it. It used to be subcutaneous. It's usually about two thirds of cases done under general anaesthetic, but it can be done under sedation, particularly if a regional block is used. So you can infuse local anaesthetic into either underneath the serratus on top of the rib or between the serratus and the latissimus. The fibrillation safety margin testing is strongly recommended and the labelling on the device requires you to perform this when you implant it in contrast to transvenous devices. And patients need to pass pre-implant ECG screening with approximately 15% failure rate. 
and um, this is because the device senses from the surface ECG. It has conditional and rate only zones but they're both shock only. It is MRI compatible although an MRI may destroy the audible alarm and it does uh, have a remote follow-up option although not with quite the same um, user uh, friendliness of, of a transvenous device. It does have very limited monitoring functions so it doesn't give you if the patient's syncopal and they haven't um, had either a shock or a diverted shock it, it won't generally tell you why that is so it won't tell you if they've had a bradyarrhythmia and it won't tell you if they've had a tachyarrhythmia below the treatment zone or not long enough lasting to have triggered the, the, the counters. Um, it does have some uh, sensing function for atrial fibrillation so it will give you an AF burden although um, that's from the surface ECG and not infrequently you'll find it it's not accurate. Um, its only pacing function is some very limited post-shock transcutaneous pacing. It has no bradycardia or ATP functions and the longevity is somewhere between 5 and 10 years. Um, in this case we do have randomised control data to compare it with the um, transvenous standard in the form of the uh, Praetorian study. So this was a non-inferiority study comparing a wide range of patients indicated for a secondary or primary prevention ICD who did not have an indication for pacing. Um, and essentially, the subcutaneous ICD is non-inferior to the transvenous ICD. There are slightly more inappropriate therapies, at least in the, in the narrow window of the first few years of follow-up, uh, but there are significantly fewer implant related complications and infection related issues and obviously the nature of transvenous complications is that they become uh, more prominent over time so one would expect um, longer term follow-ups of this cohort to potentially show um, a different balance and potentially a greater um, sway towards the benefit of a subcutaneous over a transvenous ICD. So further developments which are on the cards for the transvenous ICD. So one-way comms to a leadless ATP device as I described, um, improved monitoring capabilities and algorithms to avoid the need for doing a defibrillation safety margin test at implant because people have got a bit squeamish about that these days. So what about leadless LV endocardial? Well, this is uh, at a early stage of development, I would say, compared to the other two technologies. Um, the um, benchmarking standard trial, the, the SOLVE CRT trial, has completed recruitment but hasn't yet reported. This is a device made by a company called EBR, or a standalone corporation. Um, the device consists of an ultrasound transmitter, which is implanted um, in the rib space and then an endocardial transducer which is implanted in the left ventricle. Um, there are practical barriers, uh, so it, this is implanted where there are practical barriers or there's a high risk to an LV endocardial lead or in patients who are non-responders to conventional CRT. Um, so unfortunately this can't be implanted if a patient has a mechanical valve prosthesis because the acoustic noise from the mechanical valve interferes with the ultrasound signal to the from the transmitter to the transducer. They have to pass screening of the ultrasound windows on their chest wall, about 90% of patients will pass that. And you have to be able to gain retrograde or transeptal access to the left ventricle to be able to implant the transducer. And um, importantly, it's not a standalone device. It needs to work off a co-implanted device for sensing, so it triggers from an existing pacing spike. So, where have we got to? So there's potentially a dream here. We could have an entirely leadless system performing all of the functions of a CRTD. Defibrillation subcutaneously, Brady pacing, ATP and CRT via LV, endocardial systems and we could also have some heart failure monitoring with things like the CardioMEMS device. But is it really a dream or is it in fact a nightmare? Six independent components with at least eight communication 
link, links and failure and generator changes on four separate devices and a cost which is really going to become prohibitive. So the SICD is probably not a lot more expensive than a standard transvenous ICD, but the Micra is somewhere between five and ten times the cost of a standard bradycardia pacemaker and the uh, LV endocardial system has two separate components to it, each of which cost about the same as a, uh, as a standard CRTP. So if you put all of those together, compared to the cost of a CRTD, it's going to be at least four times the cost. So full functionality um, leads-based devices are going to be with us for some time. But alternative approaches for single function devices and specific patients with exclusions to standard technology are already a valuable option. Uh, sparing patients indwelling leads even for a part of their life is of value in reducing the risk of complications, even if they need to be upgraded to a transvenous device in the future. And rechargeable technology would be a game changer in the palatability of all of these types of technology. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. John Pesey, for that excellent and informative lecture. Um, and on behalf of uh, SLCC, uh, I thank you uh, uh, from the whole uh, <coughs> of Sri Lanka Heart Association, uh, the, the whole of Sri Lanka Heart Association. Let's move on to the next lecture. And I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Rohan Gunamadhan to introduce the next speaker.